Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Good morning. Thank you to Jeff Petty for organizing this and devoting a whole grand rounds of peas. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, also, thank you, of course, to Bob and Randy for making it all possible. Hopefully, I'll be able to figure out how to get my presentation going. Yeah, any residents or fellows feel free <laughs> to help Here, me. Uh, the Mac and the Mac. The there we go. Okay. I just use this one. <coughs> Super. Thank you. Aparna Rama Subramanian is the name of the last presenter, and I suspect you're going to be hearing that name a lot more in the coming decades. I think she'll be compared to Carol Shields one day. Unfortunately, she's leaving us for love <laughs> because her husband <laughs> is taking her with him wherever they end up and I wish her the best of luck. So we're gonna switch gears a bit to strabismus. And the patient I'm gonna talk about and presenting for many reasons, many teaching points teaching points for medical students, residents, fellows, teaching points for faculty, and uh, teaching points for general ophthalmologists. The patient was in initially seen by Bob Hoffman many years ago. This patient has a lifelong condition that started during childhood. And the first thing I'd like to touch on is just diagnosis. I don't have uh, all photos in all gaze positions, but a few. And you'll see here the measurements, measurements that were done on this adult back in 1995. Because I saw the patient up at the Leighton Satellite Clinic and not here, I don't have strabismus photos of this particular patient and so these measurements are larger than what you see in the patient. But the photos do demonstrate some of the findings well enough that I included them. So any of the residents or fellows want to take a stab at a diagnosis based on uh, the strabismus exam? Anyone? Anyone? So Brian Stagg is uh, not here and I would pick on him because he's on peas. <laughs> uh, so this patient is a 35 prism doctor left hypertrophy and primary gaze, quite large. It increases in right gaze and it increases with left tilt. And if you look at the photo here, there's a finding that is helpful to make the diagnosis. Sure, go ahead, way in the back. Yeah, that's, that's what the patient has. So this patient had strabismus since childhood and went unoperated uh, during childhood and only during adulthood did, uh, did the patient seek out care. So this exam is consistent with the unilateral superior oblique paresis. And notice that the deviation is larger in right gaze, larger right and down and, and quite large in down gaze. So with a 44-year-old adult who's had lifelong strabismus, uh, for the residents, are, are there any concerns about a neuroophthalmic problem? Do you have any concerns about additional testing? Or is the history sufficient to say that there's no underlying neurologic cause of the fourth nerve paresis? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And also looking for neuro-ophthalmic signs on the exam, such as nystagmus, optic atrophy, as taking a decent review of systems, looking for neurologic symptoms. All that's reassuring enough that I, I definitely do not evaluate these patients uh, further. So moving on up, uh, higher up on the, the educational hierarchy, 
uh, for the pediatric ophthalmologist, any faculty. Uh, this is, this photo is not the patient, so he's fusing with a head tilt. And um, he's a surgical candidate, but, but our patient actually has constant diplopia and has had constant diplopia for many, many years. And um, any, any ideas on treatment here? Would prison work? Eye muscle surgery? No, I hear, I hear no. Prism will, will not be helpful for that sort of deviation, and um, prism also in large torsional deviations is not helpful. Prism can't help torsion. So this is uh, a surgical candidate. Um, so any ideas for surgery? What, what surgeries would be considered? Any testing intraoperatively that might be helpful, especially in a patient with a congenital fourth cranial nerve paresis? Anyone Definitely want to comment? Mm -hmm. This guy seems to have quite a bit. I mean, if you look at these options, he has quite a bit of anterior peripheral reaction, but I don't see that so much in this measurement for the for the super anterior in the primary of the left. Right, and these this isn't the patient, unfortunately. But uh, I'll, but I'll tell you, these versions are the patient. Are the patient. So it looks similar to him. So I mean, looking at those. You Right, absolutely. Uh, anyone else want to comment? Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Bob took the patient to the operating room and did uh, forced suction testing of the superior oblique. Now, the superior oblique can be quite lax physically, especially with congenital superior oblique paresis. And these children tend to have very large head tilts and they tend to be a bit troublesome in treatment uh, simply because they often need multiple surgeries in the end, but you don't know up front if they're going to need <coughs> multiple surgeries, multiple muscles. When you find a very lax superior oblique tendon, it can even be absent where there's no superior oblique. So with the finding of laxity, you have to explore the tendon. And when Bob did that, he found the tendon, but it was very, uh, very thin, very lax, and did a huge tuck. 20 millimeters is a very large tuck of the superior oblique. And that was the right thing to do. What we shoot for is shortening the superior oblique tendon with the tuck such that with forced suction testing, the eye starts to uh, have resistance to elevation and adduction as the inferior, inferior limbus crosses the horizontal midline between the campi. And um, the patient did well, had a nice response to surgery. 20 prism doppler left hypertropia in primary gaze, 25 here. And in parentheses is the number of prism diopters of correction that this huge tuck achieved. So again, you can't predict uh, the, uh, how, many, uh, how much of the ocular deviation you'll get from a tuck. And so additional surgery was offered to the patient. And at that point, um, she declined additional surgery uh, and did not come back for follow-up. And then this, again, look, this is 1995. So she lived a good 20, about 19 years. And then I saw her up at the Leighton Clinic. And this is the, um, the exam at that point. She's lived with diplopia, ignored one image, and had an abnormal appearance and has put up with that but she is interested in improvement. So n now what to do? So now you can see she still has a hypertropia, <coughs> but because she hasn't been fusing, fusing she started to develop an esotropia. And um, there is still incompetence to the hypertropia. And there's a V pattern to the esotropia, a V pattern to the horizontal deviation. And she has a large amount of excyclotorsion. Now I'm pointing out all those findings to give you an idea how challenging it is to do surgery for cyclovertical uh, strabismus. So we have to think in three dimensions in different gaze positions, not just primary gaze. So it's pretty tricky to do, to, to plan. Um, here's a fundus photograph of excyclotorsion of the left eye that was present. And 
You can measure that with double Maddox rod testing, Bagolini lenses, but frankly, you can just ask the patient, how much does your second image tilt? And you really get a sense of how much torsion they have. So at this point, she wants more help, and she's a surgical patient. Any, this is, uh, this is a challenge. She has, Randy. She's ignored her diplopia and just kind of lived with it. She's a very shy uh, lady, uh, and um, she just decided not to pursue more. Uh, and since you asked that question, Randy, I'll, one of the teaching points is here is d don't give up. Don't give up on the adults with strabismus. Encourage them to seek out care because there's a happy ending at the end of this case. Uh, and uh, so for, for the strabismus gurus, any any thoughts on um, this complex case, what, what you would consider doing? Well, now, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, now for sure I'd go after that old weight because you've got a V pattern, you've got a, um, uh, you know, you've got the and from what, looking to the left, you've got a, quite a bit of S cycle torsion. Right, so just, just to share with you my uh, surgical decision making for complex cyclovertical strabismus, the way I view it is I try to um, treat each of the three dimensions one step at a time with the hope that the treatment for the deviation in one dimension doesn't disturb it in another. Just to be clear, there's a vertical deviation and it's incomitant, okay? So there's a vertical deviation in primary gaze that increases in right gaze and there's still overaction of the inferior oblique. So one principle of strabismus surgery is if you have vertical incomitance and overaction and underaction of the oblique muscles, the oblique muscles need to be addressed surgically <coughs> in order to get that incomitance. So uh, that's the first thing. And in, in this patient, I, I thought an inferior oblique recession would be the best way to go. Nicely, that has, uh, that hits another one of my goals, torsion. That helps with x torsion. And you can expect to achieve anywhere from three to maybe eight degrees of x torsion with an inferior oblique recession. So we're making progress. You know, we're making progress there. So the next goal, the next dimension, if you will, is the horizontal deviation. And it also is incomitant because there's a V pattern. So there's an esotropy in primary gaze that increases in down gaze. And so, of course, we have to address the esotropy in primary gaze. But if we don't do something for that V pattern as well, there'll be diplopia in down gaze, even though you have treated the horizontal deviation in primary gaze. And the inferior oblique recession actually is a three four, a three four. It'll help you with a V pattern too, but maybe not enough in, in, in this case. And, um, and so one of, 
for V patterns, operating on oblique muscles can be helpful, but also transposing horizontal recti can be helpful. So I thought doing a recession of her meteor, meteor recti with an inferior transposition would help. And for the residents, remember the acronym MALE, medials to the apex, laterals to the empty space for patterns. Uh, one of the troubles though, and this is where it gets a little sticky, is that if you transpose recti, you can induce torsion. And indeed, if you inferiorly transpose um, the medial recti, in this case, you'll likely worsen the excyclotorsion. So to get the pattern, the V pattern treated with the transposition, the excyclotorsion can be worsened. And so I decided because of that, as well as um, having 15 degrees of excyclotorsion, that a procedure that specifically addresses torsion would be needed. This, the, the surgery called the Harada Ito on her opposite eye. So um, those are my thoughts. And in the operating room, she, did, she no longer had superior oblique tendon laxity. That was very well treated. She also had no restriction of her superior rectus or inferior rectus in the, the um, hypertropic eye for the superior rectus and the hypotropic eye for the inferior rectus. Over time, over decades in fact, with the large vertical deviation, muscles shorten. And that may need to be addressed, but as it turned out, they weren't restricted in her. So that didn't need to be addressed. And finally, that's another uh, little pearl about strabismus surgery. Muscles can become restricted over time with constant deviations over decades. And if you don't address that, you won't get success. So that wasn't there. So I stuck with the original plan, 10 millimeter inferior oblique recession, the a four millimeter medial rectus recession, both sides with a one half tendon with infraplacement. I did a right uh, superior oblique Harada Ido, uh, just to be specific with the Fels modification because Harada Ido's isn't exactly what I did. Uh, Fels modified this procedure, I don't know, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, but it amounts to taking one half to one quarter of the superior oblique tendon and moving it from the back of the eye to the front of the eye, making it a better intorter. And uh, so she, she did pretty well with that. And uh, don't let this uh, messy slide confuse you. Let me just stick right to this number. So her hypertropia was about the same, but it was now comitant. The incomitance was treated. Her V pattern was gone and her horizontal deviation was gone and her excyclodorsion was down to four degrees. And she could fuse this with vertical prism. And at that point, I wanted to have a parade in fireworks <laughs> because uh, it's torsion, vitreous seeds are the enemy in retinoblastoma, torsion's the enemy in complex cyclovertical strabismus. So if you can get torsion, th then, then, you, then you're 90% of the way. So she couldn't fuse. She still had her hypertropia, but she could see big improvement. She started to get you know, more excited and she said, well, what's the next step? And I offered her prism and she said, no, I, you know, and I said, but additional surgery is a possibility. And um, so I offered her that. Any, any thoughts on the next procedure for a comitant hypertropia in a patient who's had the previous surgeries? The previously recessed one. Mm -hmm. On the right inferior. Well, uh, that is what she had on an adjustable suture. And the first day after surgery, she was starting to fuse. She still had her hypertropia most of the time, but she was starting to fuse. And what was really nice is it was comitant across the board. Her horizontal was gone, and she could control the sex cyclotorsion herself with fusion. So super happy. And then months later, she came back, and she was fusing in all gaze positions. <laughs> and then I did have a parade in fireworks. I was so happy. <laughs> um, so I guess the teaching points are diagnosis for the residents, no three-step testing, know how to diagnose a unilateral superior oblique paresis, 
know that if it's congenital, it's been present for a lifetime in an otherwise completely healthy patient on whose re review assistance is negative that you don't have to scan them. You don't have to worry about a neuro-ophthalmic problem. For the uh, strabismus surgeons in the room, this, you know, you have to think about all three dimensions, horizontal, vertical, torsional deviations, and thank goodness we don't have a fourth dimension. <laughs> I'll stop there. Any questions? Yeah, force duction testing in the operating room, and over the years, I've become way more picky about the technique for force ductions too. Uh, I didn't touch on that earlier, but I'll touch on it real quickly. So, in order to make sure that you're doing proper force ductions for recti, both vertical and horizontal, you really need to grasp the globe in two places. Um, for example, for the vertical recti, you need to elevate and depress the eye. But the, I like to put the forceps at three and nine o'clock and make sure the globe isn't depressed into the orbit. You can't push the globe in or you'll put slack on those muscles, right? Um, and so I make sure the globe is, is elevated just slightly and then I do my force ductions. And then for the obliques, the opposite is true. To put the obliques on taut stretch, you have to retropulse the globe slightly, for example, for the superior oblique, and then excyclotort the eye, and that puts the tendon uh, on stretch and you can feel the uh, uh, for, uh, restriction far better. So just a few tips with force ductions. Other questions? <coughs>